Uh, that's actually a rather good question and one that I get asked many times. So Warden actually is the oldest uh, title for a head of an Oxford, or maybe even for an Oxford and Cambridge uh, college, and it comes from the, uh, the, the Norman word, uh, which has the same uh, root as guardian, so it has both a kind of a, a sort of protective uh, function uh, as well as one that's sort of a, more of a controlling function. I get asked that question a lot when I go to North America, uh, what is a warden, and people assume that I run some kind of a correctional institution. And I remember when the job was advertised, it actually had to explain warden brackets, head of college, just in case people did apply from a different, uh, different job sectors who would, might have been disappointed when they got to um, as far as an interview. So it's a very old job title uh, in Oxford, um, but it's a fascinating job. Effectively, essentially, the role of the warden is to ensure that the college sticks to its mission statement, which is to have the environment to do, or to provide the environment for the best possible research in what I call area and development studies in social sciences, but more generally international relations, international economics, uh, history, politics, anthropology, and sociology, related to all the different areas of the world. We, we cover in our regional study centers all areas of the world, except possibly not much on North America, and of course not much on the UK or Australasia. So that's basically what the role of warden is, is to ensure that the college is operating effectively. Ultimately, I report to the trustees who are the governing body, um, and to also, of course, continually look to the future, to raise funds to make sure that we can carry on doing things into the future, and to try and sort of develop various strategies that the governing body can then discuss and endorse or not endorse, which we can then put into place at an operational level through the management executive team or, or the Met, who are more responsible for the operational side of the college. Um, well, I'm, I'm lucky that I have a number of wider roles uh, in the university. So in particular, uh, the governing body kindly allowed me to continue in my role as the Nissan Professor of Japanese Studies. So I think I may be the only current head of an Oxford college who has a joint appointment, where I'm both the warden, but also have an academic appointment, which means I can carry on doing my teaching which I love doing, and, and my research, uh, which I also enjoy doing. So that's my main other role within the university. But I'm also something with a rather strange job title called Pro Vice Chancellor Without Portfolio. So every year the Vice Chancellor appoints a number of people from within the university to have these roles, which then basically cover for the Vice Chancellor sometimes at ceremonial events. So I do matriculation events, for example, or at various public lectures, or there's just so many of these events that go on, uh, or even church services, which the Vice Chancellor herself couldn't possibly attend. I also get to uh, chair many of the professorial appointment committees, particularly in social sciences, but occasionally also in humanities, again, because it would be impossible for the Vice Chancellor to chair uh, all of those herself. And also I do various other roles in the university as called upon, so at the minute, um, I'm the chair of the management board of the continuing education department, which is a fascinating uh, role. And I'm also doing a major building project for the university, which is the Osney Power Station, which is being turned into an executive education center. So I'm what's called the senior responsible officer on that project who represents the university with all the other partners as part of that project. And ultimately report through to the vice chancellor on how a project like that is going. So I'm very lucky. I have a wide variety of roles uh, within the wider university, which all of, hope, all of which I hope feeds into my role as warden uh, at St. Anthony's and helps the college in the way that it integrates it better into the wider university. Um, well, for um, the last 20 years or so, uh, every Sunday I've been uh, coaching uh, hockey. Um, so, um, at the moment, for the last few years, I've been the, the coach for the Oxford under-12 boys hockey team. Uh, but actually, I've coached all different levels, all different ages. I ended up doing uh, the under-12s because I've discovered that's the only age group where they listen to what you say, uh, but they don't ask you why you said it. That's my theory. So I did the younger age groups where basically it was just like childcare. You could never get them to stop running around and listen and the older age groups where they would question everything you asked them to do. So I've done the under 12s. And they used to be under, boy, under 12 boys and girls. We used to train together until about 10 years ago when we had to separate them because the girls adolesce so much more quickly than the boys. 
that the boys couldn't keep up, so that's why we separated them. So I've done that for about, actually, just over 20 years, uh, which is a lot of fun and very successful. I'm going to boast here. My team have been the county champions for the last two years, which is very exciting, because then you go and play in the sort of regionals and the nationals and so on. So that's my Sunday mornings. And on Saturdays, I normally go running. I run several times uh, a week. I think it's more mental health, actually, than any other form of health. It's just the way to get out and just to see the countryside. And Oxford's a brilliant place for running. There are so many different places uh, you can go to. And I either run on my own listening to music or podcasts, or I run with friends and, and chat as we go along. So I think those are probably my two main consistent activities that I do in my free time. Uh, yeah, and no, I'm really excited about my sabbatical, so I'm very grateful to the governing body that's given me a year to go away and do a new project. First time in 20 years that I've done a new project, which will be essentially on the Japanese health system. And I've been curious for a long time about how the health system, health system operates in Japan and became even more curious during the pandemic. And I quite often got phone calls during the pandemic from journalists asking me to explain why the Japanese system was responding the way that it was. And I, not, only, not only could I not answer the questions, I couldn't really find any good books that would tell me the answers to those questions. And there was one thing in particular that fascinated me, which was that 65% uh, or perhaps even more of the hospitals and clinics in Japan absolutely refused to take COVID patients. They said they wouldn't take them. And it turned out that most of these were small family-run hospitals and clinics, and that actually they are the, uh, the dominant force in the health system in Japan. And we know the Japanese health system overall has very effective outcomes. People live a long time in Japan, very high health statistics. We know it's very cheap. And we now know that you know 65 percent of these institutions are family-run businesses so my real research puzzle is what's the relationship between those three things and um, is there anything we could learn from these family-run businesses in a very advanced technological and economically advanced country like japan that might be a transferable piece of knowledge that we could look at for our own system so i always go and look at japan as a way of thinking about the way we do things in our own country you know, any lessons that we can learn but it's a genuine puzzle. I genuinely know nothing about this topic at all. I didn't actually know very much about health systems in total. So in the past, I've worked on welfare systems and I've worked on educational systems. So for me, it's a completely new area. But I'm really excited. And I'm going to be in Tokyo from the 1st of October, probably spend about nine months there, visiting as many institutions as possible, talking to as many policymakers as possible, um, just trying to get a feel for how the system works and then coming back and writing some of it up. So that's a very broad outline of how I'm hoping to spend next year. I don't think anybody knows this story that happened uh, when I was 17 in my life, but um, uh, if they do, apologies. But um, I, I got a burst appendix in the Negev desert when I was 17, um, riding a bus, actually riding a bus to a hospital across the desert in the hope that somebody could work out what was wrong with me, uh, which was quite exciting. And um, I ended up in a hospital, in, in a very basic hospital in a city called Beersheva in the mid-1970s. And was very lucky because there was a Russian surgeon there who had been sent to this hospital as part of his immigration plan. So he'd been allowed to uh, immigrate, or immigrate to Israel but only if he went and worked in a field hospital for a period of time. And he was apparently highly skilled, and he managed to sort out the uh, peritonitis, which happened as a result of um, a burst appendix. But uh, I was subsequently told that it was pretty amazing that I managed to get to the hospital in one piece and then to come out of the hospital in one piece. So I think that's possibly the most exciting thing, if exciting is the right word. <laughs> I mean, I think I'd like a radio because I'm a bit addicted to the news, but I suspect I'd get less addicted to the news quite quickly if I was stuck on a desert island. You're probably not allowed a radio, so I think that one probably wouldn't be allowed. Um, I'd like my running shoes because going running is an important part of my life. But um, I guess I could get used to running barefoot, so I probably don't actually need running shoes food and drink things. Um, I'm basically addicted to ginger. Anything that's got ginger in, I love. Um, so if 
if I could have an endless supply of ginger on the island and I could do things with it, that would be important. A tea, I drink gallons of tea, Yorkshire tea, good quality, gold blend Yorkshire tea, a lifetime supply of Yorkshire tea. And um, the thing I always do when I don't know what I want to do next is get a jigsaw puzzle out, actually. So quite often at home, I have jigsaw puzzles out because it just sort of clears my mind. So if I could have a supply of jigsaw puzzles, thousand piece jigsaw puzzles, um, not too difficult, so not just a picture of sand, but with some images in it, um, that would be something that would keep me occupied and relatively happy. I don't think I'd be very good on my own. I think I need company, but um, those are three things that would make it more tolerable. So that's ginger, Yorkshire tea, and jigsaw puzzles. Okay, those are my three things. Thank you.